Hello, everyone. My name is Thomas, and I'm going to kick off this presentation called JobZQ Pi Chimera Texas Roundtable. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to say a few words about our company, Chimera Economics and Analytics. We provide labor market data and analysis so our clients can make informed decisions that help their communities thrive. We are founded in 1998 by Dr. Chris Chimura, who is one of our panelists today, and we have offices in Richmond, Cleveland, and Dallas. Who we are are economists, data scientists, statisticians, and business professionals who care about helping your community grow. We are driven by client satisfaction and success. And excellence is our first priority in customer service and data quality. And this is brought primarily by our state-of-the-art labor market data platform, Jobs EQ, which we'll be showing you a little bit of today. If you want to know more about Jobs EQ and how you can see it for yourself via a demo, feel free to toggle over to the sidebar under offers and schedule a demo. You can also see on that sidebar there is a chat box. Uh, some of you are already utilizing it, but if you have any questions uh, for any of the presenters, uh, just feel free to leave your question there and I'll forward it to the presenters and we'll get to it at the end of the presentation. We have a number of free resources at Shamara, including a blog, a podcast, and our weekly economic update. This is delivered every week to your inbox and it's a national overview of the economy written by our economists, including Chris. If you want to subscribe to the weekly economic update, uh, I'll post the link in the chat shortly, or you could just leave your email there and I'll manually insert it. But I will be putting that link uh, in just a couple of minutes. Moving on, our presenters today, starting off, Chris Chimura, our CEO and chief economist. She is a national thought leader on labor economics, and she has a passion for helping people use economic data to drive community and organizational growth. Mark Hayes is the managing director of sales and business development with Shimura, and he also has a life passion for helping people succeed, businesses grow, and communities thrive. And our guest speaker today, Tim Samuels it, from Dallas College, is the Associate Chief of Workforce at Dallas College. On to the presentation. Thank you, Thomas. So I'll be talking about the National Economic um, Update, encouraging economic trends. Progress toward herd immunity has slowed, um, but we're still seeing some good trends in terms of the economy. And then I'll end by talking about Texas. Um, Mark will then uh, take up talking about opportunities for your community, and then Tim will follow up with how Dallas College is using Jobs EQ to collaborate with employers, EDOs, and others amid the very strong employment growth that we have in Texas. So now back to the national overview. Um, Pre-COVID, the economy was fundamentally strong, um, and you could see that on some of these charts here. But uh, across the globe, a uh, recession is defined as two quarterly declines in real GDP. But here in the U.S., we have the National Bureau of Economic Research, Research NBER, that defines recession dates. Um, and these are some of the um, variables that they look at to define the recession. So this first one, employment, notice the strong employment growth over the past decade. When we went into the lockdown, we saw employment drop off quickly, and I want you to take note of this. Notice we lost all of the jobs created over the previous expansion, because when I show you Texas, it's going to look very different. Uh, we're seeing employment coming back. The latest increase, increase was 850,000 jobs, very strong growth. Um, in fact, we've, uh, we've um, seen about 50, more than 50% of the jobs come back already. Typically, it takes two years for that to happen after going into a recession. The right-hand side, Personal income and consumption, this is spending by consumers, is extremely important because spending by consumers makes up about 70% of GDP. And when we went into the lockdown, you can see the dramatic drop off. This is the percent change from a year ago, down more than 15%. And then the rebound has been stronger than expected. And the most recent month, 
you can see almost up to 25% growth from a year ago. And of course, part of this is because we're no longer locked down, people are getting out and spending. And part of it is also due to the fact that we received a lot of stimulus money. Um, households received um, uh, at least two um, times where they received money um, from the federal government from a stimulus perspective. And then the unemployment insurance uh, right now is higher than typical because of the federal additional spending uh, or addition um, that the federal government is giving on unemployment insurance. So um, consumer looks strong, employment coming back strong, industrial production, another indicator that uh, the NBER looks at. And here, this is um, production of utilities, of mining and manufacturing. Again, huge drop off when the recession began and now we're seeing a, a good rebound in that sector. GDP, um, the Great Recession um, is shown here. This was the deepest uh, recession that we had and the longest since the Great Depression. But notice that the current recession was even worse uh, due to COVID. First quarter of last year, a decline annualized of about 5%, then nearly 30% annualized decline. But look at the rebound. Uh, the rebound was very strong in the third quarter of last year, fourth quarter, also almost 5% growth, and the latest data, 6.4% GDP growth. Now, going forward, we expect to see the economy grow at a very strong rate in the next year and a half because of all of the stimulus and because of people finally coming back into um, spending money and feeling more secure and going out. This growth is extremely strong. Typically, if you see something around 2% or 1.5%, that's considered good growth. So here we're seeing above historical averages over the next year and a half. And then when we get to 2023, we'd expect it to slow down a bit. Um, herd immunity. So we've been tracking this because, of course, that has an impact on how fast the economy will get back to pre-COVID levels. And here... Um, you see some data on the number of infections from COVID, the seven day moving average in orange and the blue, the number of um, actual cases. And you could see um, after Thanksgiving, we had an increase after uh, the uh, holidays in December, we had an increase. And then we saw the numbers coming down significantly, spring break, a little bit of an increase. And now the numbers, although up a bit, are still below the April 2020 levels. Um, here, we're looking at the University of Washington's forecast uh, in terms of, of or actual data here and then their forecast. So we're using this in our underlying model. Typically, as economists, we'll use assumptions such as interest rate changes or price of gasoline or oil to drive our models. But in this case, um, we're using health um, situation, the number of infections. Um, since we're not medical doctors, we're relying again on the University of Washington's um, forecast. So right now, what are we seeing? 600 to two, 600 vaccines purchased from Moderna and Pfizer, 200 from J&J. &J. In the U.S., we have about 350 million people. Um, this vaccine, of course, these vaccines, you need to get two shots as opposed to one with Johnson & Johnson. Um, President um, Biden's hope was to have 70% of Americans vaccinated by um, July 4th, at least the first vaccine. We didn't quite make it. We're still at 55.5% with a single dose as of July 12th and 48% fully vaccinated, according to CDC. Um, so right now, on average, we're administering 527,000 doses per day. To give you a sense of how that stands relative to the past, we were running 1 million uh, doses on average per day at the beginning of the year, and we peaked out a couple of months ago at 4 million doses per day, and it's been coming down since then. In terms of the Delta variant, so far, early studies of the vaccines show that they remain effective against the uh, Delta variant. And so we're continuing to closely monitor this information because it does, to some degree, impact um, the forecast. So. We have a model, a herd immunity model, and if you would like to see more about it, you can click on this link below, but we have three scenarios. So the optimistic scenario, um, here's 80% herd immunity. 
would be in October of this year. The most likely model, we believe it would be at year end before we get to 80%. And then uh, pessimistic would not be until uh, summer of next year that we get to herd immunity. Um, but clearly, even though we're not yet to herd immunity, um, things are really picking up in the economy. Um, you may wonder how it's doing around the nation relative to Texas. And here you see uh, when we expect states to get to herd immunity relative to our most likely scenario. Uh, New Mexico getting there the soonest in September if things uh, trends continue as they are. Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa all um, very favorable as uh, some states in the Northeast. But then on the other hand, um, you see Georgia, Tennessee um, lagging at an estimate of February and also Utah lagging. And here you are, um, Texas, somewhere in between, probably around January, getting to herd immunity if trends continue um, as they are. So uh, within this environment, the labor market is getting tighter and I'm sure in Texas is even tighter than um, uh, the U.S. on average. In fact, I know it is even tighter. So here in the nation, the unemployment rate surged up to 15 percent. When we were in lockdown, we were told to stay at home if possible. Some businesses such as restaurants closed. And then on the right hand side is the participation rate. So the percentage of people who are actually working or looking for work. Each it goes back to 1950 and each of these gray shaded areas are recessions. So notice the participation rate dropped um, tremendously. We're back to levels not seen since 1970. It has increased, but still at very low levels um, since the late 1970s. So why is it staying down um, so much? And here I have some suggestions, early retirement. Some people have just decided to retire early because of, of COVID. Um, some people fear contracting the virus and are not coming into the back into the labor market yet. Um, there are some individuals who have children that are learning from home online and so they're needing to stay at home while those uh, kids are learning. They may come back into the labor market in September and also um, the generous federal unemployment insurance will run out um, after Labor Day so that may cause some people to come back. And then finally some people since they've had this time where perhaps they were looking for working for retail, they had three months where they were unemployed, but they were getting um, um, benefits, generous benefits. They may have gone back to school. They may have considered some online courses. So they may have moved from retail to say, for example, IT, which is much in demand. So that again, may be keeping um, the participation rate uh, low, especially for some jobs such as in retail accommodation and food services. But the other thing that we're seeing here is that this has been a very atypical um, recession. And of course, we talked about those um, hindrances that are keeping people from coming into the labor market that's causing this, um, this, un this very tight labor market. So here you're looking at job ads, and this comes from the BLS. It's um, called the JOLTS uh, data. That stands for job openings and labor turnover survey. And we're seeing that more people are quitting right now. In fact, at a highest rate that we've seen since the BLS has started keeping these data in 2002. So back in April, 4 million people quit their job. Um, so that's the quit rate of 2.7%. It fell in May to 2.5%, but it still remains very high. So We've got the situation where um, there was pent up demand for hiring. So people were not hiring. Businesses were not hiring until they knew that demand for their services would continue. And then on the other hand, you had individuals. This always happens during a recession where they're uncertain that they're going to be able to find a job. So they don't quit as much during recessions. You see that during the COVID recession as well. But once things start to open up, they think they can find a job then they go out and quit and do find alternative employment. But notice it does go up at a slow rate. This past time we saw a huge jump in the quit rate. So now moving on to the Texas economy. Uh, here we're looking at employment uh, year over year change. Blue is uh, Texas, the loose shaded area compared to the US. So the first thing you notice is that Texas did much better during the recession. 
uh, the COVID recession. We didn't see a strong drop off as much as we saw in the nation. Uh, latest data here, you're looking at 4.5% down from a year ago, 5.9% uh, down from a year ago in the U.S. And if we look at it over time, notice that for the most part, your economy is growing faster than the U.S. And during the last recession, you did not drop as much as in the U.S. And of course, um, that's because of your um, dependence on the energy uh, industry. When we look at total employment, notice here the drop off. You've lost 618,000 jobs so far during the COVID recession. In the um, Great Recession, you lost 363,000. But remember, I told you on the U.S. chart to take note of it because uh, Texas will be very different. So if your employment trends in Texas went the same way as in the nation, you would have seen about a 3 million job loss. Your job loss would have been right down here. But you're growing at such a fast pace that it's making up for some of these job losses that are occurring because of the COVID recession. So now looking um, at the industry mix, um, and what I'd like to, you to do first is look at the very bottom. So here we're looking at total in, annual average employment growth. It says for one year, but this is a one-year forecast on average for 10 years is what you would see, but we're showing it to you as just a one-year. Texas expected to grow 1.3% every year on average for the next 10 years compared to 0.4% in the U.S. So you're expected to grow at least three times as fast as the nation over the next 10 years. So these are the major industry sectors um, in terms of the way that uh, the federal government groups employment um, and data by industry. And what I did here is I ranked ordered it by the one year change because I wanted to get a sense of how your industries were faring uh, relative to those in the nation. So no surprise, accommodation and food service lost 179,000 jobs down 14%, similar to what we see in the nation. The next largest decline was mining, uh, mainly oil and gas extraction, and down 22%. Um, some of that due to COVID, some also due to the um, incidents with uh, the um, Russia at the beginning of this um, uh, pandemic, um, bringing the price of oil down. If we look at some of the other sectors, art and entertainment, down 18%. Again, that's the sector in the U.S. that has seen the second largest decline. And then similar to the um, U.S., if we go to the very bottom, there are some industries where you've actually seen employment grow over the pandemic. Professional, scientific, and technical services, because many of those jobs can be done at home, such as accounting, attorneys, um, consulting, engineering, uh, transportation and warehouse grew because of so many people staying at home and purchasing things online to be sent to their house. Finance and insurance, again, a, a industry where you can work from home. Um, so we saw 9,000 jobs created. And public administration, which is government, again, uh, the creation of jobs there. Here you see now total employment uh, in each of these sectors with healthcare being the largest. Again, that's similar to what we see in the US and retail second largest, again, similar to what we see in the US. In terms of wages, your average wage in Texas uh, in the uh, fourth quarter of 2020 was 59,000, you could say 60,000 there. And we have some sectors that pay very well. Mining, quarrying, 136,000. And just below that is management of companies and enterprises, which is which represent headquarters or regional headquarters um, that are in Texas. Some other sectors that pay very high, professional scientific and technical services and finance and insurance, uh, both of those under 90,000. Then the next column is the location quotient. So how dependent on or, or how concentrated is an industry in Texas relative to the U.S.? With If it's over one, you're more concentrated in Texas than the U.S. So notice mining and quarrying, no surprise, is four. Um, some other sectors that are kind of high construction due to all the growth that you're seeing in the region right now, education services and wholesale trade, um, some other strong sectors um, in Texas. Now flipping all the way to the end, and again, this is the annual average growth rate um, for the next 10 years. If we go to the very top, 
you're seeing some very strong growth in accommodation and food services. Um, mining energy is high as well as healthcare. Um, and then here you see the total number of jobs that are going to be needed to be filled in Texas due to the fact that that particular industry is growing. So you're going to need 9,000 more people in retail trade industries because retail trade is growing in the region. But in addition to that, you're going to need 100,000 because some people that are working in retail are transferring into other industries. And you're going to need another 79,000 because some people are exiting. For the most part, they're retiring. So in total, retail on average every year for the next 10 years is going to need 189,000 jobs. It's much higher down here in healthcare, about 200,000. And at the very bottom, Texas is going to need to fill 1.6 million jobs on average every year for the next 10 years because of the growth overall in your industries, because people are transferring from one industry to another and some are retiring. So that's quite a large number of jobs to have to be filled on an annual basis. So with that, let me turn it over to Mark, who we who will be talking to you about creating opportunity for your community in this very strong uh, environment. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris. And I'm going to uh, get my screen share working here and make sure that everyone can, can see what we've got. So, um, hopefully you're able to, to see that. Please, uh, please let us know there if, if you can't see the slide. Wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, and some of you have heard this, and, and again, it's great to, to, to be on the, the webinar with you. Many, uh, many old friends on, on the webinar here. Uh, uh, some of you I haven't met that I hope to, uh, at some point in the near future when we, uh, we're now we're able to get out and about more and, and not, uh, not locked indoors so much. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to, to, to meet and, and become fast friends, uh, just like with many of you on here now. I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the data recently released from the census and, and, and what it did. I, my background is that uh, for, for, for uh, several years, I was the vice chancellor of workforce and economic development for Dallas College. Uh, before that was in the Oklahoma State University system in workforce and economic development. And have worked a lot with site selectors, with economic developers, with with uh, with companies and and recruiting and that sort of thing, recruiting new new businesses and business expansion, uh, as well as working uh, with colleges to uh, to in program review areas to help uh, identify programs that need to expand. Uh, also look at programs that possibly need to scale back in order to meet the labor demands of the local economy. So one of the things I wanted to talk about. Here's the, the numbers from the census and the, this recent release. Some, some very interesting trends there. And for the first time in five decades, more than half the counties lost population uh, in the United States. Two thirds of rural counties, a third of metro counties lost population over the last decade. Um, and, and, and a lot of this is due to declining birth rates. Uh, folks just simply aren't having the children today that they did even in 1990, 17% fewer than in 1990. Uh, you know, 50% fewer children than, than in 1960. A lot of factors, uh, you know, come into play there, uh, but it's just a matter that there's just fewer kids in the household today. And, and so that that affects us, of course, in the, in the long term when it comes to filling labor market needs. <clears throat> One of the more, more telling statistics here that, that, you know, there are now more Americans aged 80 and older than two or younger. So, so we are definitely becoming much older as a population. That's not a, an American phenomenon. As, 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 as dire as that situation is here, it's worse in places like uh, Japan, Germany. Uh, some of you may have seen in the news where China has recently lifted its one child policy because they've seen uh, a dramatic drop in, in, the, in the number of workers that they're going to need in future years. So they've lifted their one child policy there and uh, to try to, to, to get people to have more children in order to fill future labor market needs. Um, and, and it just comes down to that, that these demographic realities are going to hamper future economic growth. And there's just going to be an increasing war for talent, you know, quoting Richard Florida uh, here for uh, for those workers all across the, the, the country. So Governor Rick Perry, you know, years ago called uh, the, 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 the called it the Texas miracle. And, and, and in many ways it is of what Texas has done, the way it's grown, uh, the, the, the number of corporate relocations we've seen. 
to the state uh, just just in the in, in the past few years. Um, you know, corporations are taking advantage of our of our tax structure, of our of our workforce, of our uh, you know many different uh, you know business uh, favorable business conditions here. And you've all seen that the, the number of companies that are that are relocating or expanding uh, in into the state. But what are, what are some of the things on the on the horizon that, that I look at here? Um, th this is this is uh, to me, you know, one of if not the most important factor. The, the, our public schools, you know, we, we are we are failing to graduate one out of every five students. That's ten students per hour. If you figure that up, that that aren't graduating. Uh, in, in from a Texas high school. We lost nearly 87,000 students in, in 2019 to, to 2020 school year. We don't have the numbers yet for 2021 or 2020 to 2021. So, you know, the, that this doesn't even take into account the number of students that, that, were, that were affected because of, of COVID attrition. Um, and so what this does is it doesn't put us to, you know, to reach universal high school education in the state for another uh, 20 years. Um, and, and, and even more concerning, black students, Hispanic students, two times more likely to leave school without a diploma than, than white students. And if you put this into perspective, in the last 34 years, we've lost a cumulative total of more than 4 million students from public high school enrollment prior to graduation. Those are 4 million students that, that we could have had that, that could have earned post-secondary credentials that didn't, that could have filled higher paying jobs in our workforce. That, that they're not able to. And so this is a, a significant issue, a significant problem for our state. And to give you an example of, of the growth, Texas adding enough students to fill the Fort Worth ISD every year. Now, 60% of those students are in poverty, 52% are Hispanic, and 20% they don't speak any English. And so you've, you've got this situation of all these students that are coming into the state that, that, that we're adding new every year, but but they have significant issues as they come into the uh, into the public school system in the state of Texas. Um, and then for our, our, our higher education friends uh, that, that are on the webinar here, um, this is a direct a direct result of, of what we're seeing in enrollment, dropout rates, that sort of thing. The dropout rates in particular in Texas high schools. This is going to, to hit our, our higher education friends. And you look at 2025, we start a 15 percent decline in college going students uh, in, in the state of Texas. So, you know, what are we doing to, you know, to try to alleviate that? Is it, is it reaching out to more adults? Is it trying to reach out uh, to individuals to, 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 to gain more post-secondary credentials so that they can be more competitive in the job market? Um, and, and, and here is, is what I try to, to emphasize. The, 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 the cooperation between higher education, between economic development, between uh, the private sector, between chambers of commerce, between communities. You know, the thing I look at here is that there is no perfect region out there. It, it just doesn't exist. You know, if, if, if I'm a site selector and I'm looking to locate a new facility, a new plant, a new, uh, uh, you know, a, a new business in an area, I'm, I'm, I am I'm know there's no perfect region. What I'm looking at is what is that region? What are those people, the players in that region doing to address their shortcomings? Because every region has shortcomings. What are they doing to, to address that? What's their plan? It's also very important to me to look at how are you growing small business? How are you cultivating environment for entrepreneurship? You know, the, the, the you know, most job growth in this state, as well as around the country, uh, it, it comes from small businesses. So what are you doing with your existing small business? What are you doing to create an environment for entrepreneurship and for small businesses to thrive? The data is telling your story. That's what I said. That brings everyone to the table. This is the common, this is the common foundation that you can use, whether you're in education, whether you're in economic development, whatever the case may be, wherever you're, you're, you're coming from. You know, and, and you know, everyone says, well, you know, we've got the, the hardest working people in the world. Everybody says that. Every, you know, everyone hears that. And so, so you, the, the, the key here is, do you have enough of those hardworking people to, with the right skills to fill the jobs that I need for my company if I want to, to, to either expand or, or come to your area? Uh, you know, and, and if you don't have them, what's your plan? You know, what are you going to do to fill those gaps? And, and again and again, this is it, it's definitely a significantly it's a collaborative effort all the way around. So so one of the things with with Jobs EQ, with Chimera Economics and Analytics that that I've, I used at Dallas College, I used even before that. 
is it was the common bond. It was the foundation that I used to try to convene stakeholders to say, here's the data. This is what the data is telling us. What are we going to do about it as a community or as a region? You know, and, and you know, why we're here, you know, why, why does Tremor Economics and Analytics, why are we here to, to, to help uh, all of you on this on this webinar today, as well as others? We're here to help people succeed. We're here to help businesses grow and to help communities thrive. Um, Tim will go into, into more of this as well, but most of you who are Jobs EQ sub subscribers or, or clients of ours know that you see this page. This is the analytics page of our Jobs EQ platform uh, where you can pull up any of these, you know, the, these these analytics and look and, and they, all of them do wonderful, great things. If you're familiar with it, you know that. If you're not, we'll you know, be happy to have someone show you what all this, this tool can do. I, I'm, I picked Abilene just for no particular reason. Uh, I know many, we have a, a variety of people on the webinar, some from big cities, some from small communities. I picked Abilene, kind of one of those, you know, midway areas there that just to show you some of the things that Jobs EQ, what I used it for. And if I'm looking at, at locating a business, you know, business expansion, the first thing I'm going to look at is, okay, where, you know, where are my gaps? What do I need to do? And so if I'm looking at Abilene and I pull award gaps for the past year, I'm looking at registered nurses, number one. And then you can see down the list here, if they're in the red, that means you have a gap. Abilene is, has a very robust higher education community. It's got you know, three or four uh, four-year universities uh, there in, in the Abilene area. Uh, but even with all of that, there's still a lack of, of registered nurses, of medical assistants. You can see here in the healthcare areas in particular where you're seeing, where you're seeing these, these, these gaps. And, and then as you might expect, there are some areas where you, you have a surplus. Uh, and so you can see here, because of that robust higher education environment, there, 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 there are several uh, jobs, uh, occupations in the Abilene MSA that, that where you have a surplus. Now, caveat to that. The fact is, is that you may have several of these individuals that are graduating from those universities. Not all of them, of course, are staying in Abilene. They're moving back to their hometown or they're moving somewhere else where they have a job offer. It may be in Texas. It may be somewhere else. We hope they stay in the state, of course. Uh, so, so that could be a little misleading, but the fact is, is that your region probably reflects a lot of the same thing here when it comes to award gaps. You, you know, if you're, if you're on the webinar today and you're with a higher education institution, you know, you already know that you're not graduating enough nurses. You're not graduating enough medical assistants because the, you know, the, the, the labor market is, is, is telling you you're not and, and the, those jobs need to be filled. Uh, and just an example, the awards that are being given out in the, in the Abilene area. Now, I, I always looked at this when I was in education. I didn't necessarily look at it from an education perspective. I looked at it as saying, OK, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, a business owner. I want to expand my business. I want to relocate my facility to this region. Where, you know, where, where are the holes I'm looking at here? Well, as we said, Abilene has those research universities. So they've got, you know, pretty robust, uh, you know, awards from, you know, the four-year awards, postgraduate awards, and the total awards. But but if I'm looking, if I'm wanting to open a facility, for example, that I don't necessarily need to fill a lot of jobs that require a bachelor's degree, but I do need people who have post-secondary credentials, who have industry certifications, who may have, you know, associate of applied science degrees. This is my problem right here. And and so I look at that and I'm going, okay, what can we do as, as, as a, a community in Abilene to come together to try to increase the number of certificates and two years of two year awards in, in areas that I need if I'm going to relocate relocate my company or expand my company in 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 the Abilene area. This is one of the favorite analytics I always used in Jobs EQ. It's the what if scenario. So let's say that that I have a company and I want to expand in Abilene and it's a computer system design services company and I'm, I'm going to need to hire 100 workers. What are the availability? What's the availability of workers I'm going to need to fill that facility? Now, I look over here. I can see that, you know, the, the, my employer demand. I can see, the, you know, how many unemployed. I can see the, the regional average wage compared to the national wage. Um, I can see the, un, the employed, the extended employed numbers, the unemployed extend num, extended numbers. But I look at this and I'm saying, okay, how tough is it going to be 
to, to, for me to fill positions that I'm going to need. If it's in the if it's in the red or it's in the orange area, you may have some problems. This means there's less than 50 potential candidates per opening. So you can see here with the job titles, you know, I may have some issues, you know, recruiting people to this. So what if I'm looking at this in a broader perspective from the community side of things, computer user support specialist. Most of that is industry certification. Most of that is two year a type of, of, of degree programs or industry certification types. This is where an area I could up my game quickly and try to turn out more computer user support specialists to try to attract companies like this. If I'm in the green, I'm good to go. You know, things, things, things look pretty good there. So I use this extensively to, to, to look at, at the college level, at the higher education level saying we need to up our game in, in these areas. We're doing okay in others. Here's some areas we may need to scale back on because there's just simply no demand for those particular positions in, in our labor market. So why are we wasting precious resources on areas where there's there's no jobs in our labor market? So it, it really causes some some deep discussion, some some really positive, proactive discussion on as a higher education institution, which way you're you're, you're going and which way you need to to align your curriculum to meet the needs of your labor market. And then the other thing here, if I'm looking at this company in Abilene and, you know, what kind of a supply chain am I going to have? The, this tells me, hey, the things I need, I can get locally. I don't have to go to, to New Jersey to go in and pull in, uh, you know, to the, the, the supplies and, and services that I need to operate my, my, my hundred person uh, computer system design services company in Abilene. So, you know, as far as supply chain goes, I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well. I'm keeping my money local. Um, I'm cutting down on the supply chain. And so that cuts my costs. And, you know, that that helps everyone in uh, generating the local local business in the in, in the Abilene MSA and not having it go out of the region or out of uh, out of state. So with that, I uh, want to turn it over to, to a very dear friend, uh, someone I admire and respect uh, very much. Tim Samuels uh, has done wondrous work at Dallas College. He is ahead of the Ascend Institute, partnering with employers, doing some wonderful things uh, with, with Dallas College. And, and uh, Tim is a, is a guy that, that if you don't know him, you need to get to know him uh, because he is uh, just fantastic at what he does. So Tim, uh, Mark, turn it over to you. Mark, I appreciate those, those kind words and a special thanks to you for reaching out, Mark, for this uh, invitation today and a uh, special thanks to Dr. Chimura. Uh, it's always it's always exciting. It's always fun when we get a chance to talk about data analytics and talk about Jobs EQ. Uh, speaking of which, uh, when Dr. May, our chancellor, arrived at Dallas College, I want to say in 2014, uh, one of the things that he's instilled in, in all of us, the thousands of employees at the college, is that we need to use data to drive our decisions. Uh, and that permeates throughout our organization today in, in, a, in a grand fashion. And I got introduced to Jobs EQ uh, through Mark uh, about two years ago when we went and got, a couple of us went and got certified for uh, the FIT certification through the Jobs EQ platform. And it's an amazing tool. And we use it every single day in our work. And we're going to talk about some of those specific tools. And uh, Mark's going to provide some technical assistance and kind of help me advance. And you saw this slide in Mark's slide deck earlier. and. We could spend the rest of this week uh, covering all of these wonderful tools and, and these various uh, opportunities to strategize about how we use our data. Uh, but in the interest of time today, I'm going to talk about just about three or four different uh, report forms. Um, we're going to talk about the industry snapshot, uh, the spotlight summary, which is what you see right here. And what this is indicating um, is taking a global look across Dallas County. Now, mind you, um, this is not the MSA because Dallas College does not serve Arlington, Plano, Fort Worth, Tarrant County. So what I did was just drill down into just Dallas County, which is the home of Dallas College. And you can see there today uh, roughly 1.7 uh, million plus employees uh, for across all industries. And you can see what the average wages are. Uh, per earner, 71,563, and this is about 10.8% roughly above the national average. So again, as you heard from Chris and, and Mark talking about the strong Dallas economy, the strong Texas economy, this is kind of indicative of that. 
Um, you can look at the 1.6%. Uh, that's healthy. That's rising, uh, as well as the 2.7%. And this slide also depicts at the bottom of the slide uh, kind of the top occupation groups. So this, this spotlight summary, this industry spotlight summary, gives you a good overview of all employment across Dallas County today. And this was run over the last 30 days, so it's, it's fresh data, it's recent data, uh, and it's just a good snapshot to look at um, all employment. The next slide uh, is a continuation of that with again showing you the top occupation groups. Uh, and then you can look at the top industries and you see everything's in green from 1.8% to 3.3% and 2% when you look at the regions. And you know, the 1.8 is showing you the healthcare and social assistance being strong. Uh, then you're looking at the uh, professional, scientific, and technical services and the employment types. Um, so again, again, reflecting. Uh, a strong economy despite the COVID, despite the pandemic, uh, and you saw a lot of that kind of bared out in Chris's presentation. Mark, if you'd advance to the next slide. So the industry snapshot, this again is looking at just Dallas County. It's looking at employment and wages and the correlation between the two. And I always tend to look at that location quotient, the LQ, because we know that anything that's one point zero or above is growing faster than the national average and so it's always interesting to me to kind of study this trend data and look at this on a on a if not weekly basis at least monthly uh, across the county and the region of north texas now we're going to hone in from looking at all employment all industries to something very specific in manufacturing uh, where the Ascend Institute is located today is kind of in one of the hubs of the, the manufacturing of the region. And this kind of gives you an idea of what occupation types um, are, are really, really critical in, in, in need and short supply. Uh, manufacturers, like most everybody tells us all the time, where's my talent pipeline? Where's my workforce? And so we need to focus in and we hone in on looking at those particular SOC codes and those job types where there's a quite a bit of a need and, and then we try to align you know programmatic opportunities uh, business development opportunities with meeting those employer needs uh, in the manufacturing space and so this data always uh, is a uh, really important to us we were just looking at the manufacturing and now I want to talk about uh, the awards Mark showed an awards gap. He talked about some awards, so this is a little bit similar slide. But as you look at this, I, I tell you, as we've sat with site selectors and economic development corporations, and we've talked to chambers and uh, business relocation efforts, you know, this slide actually came very much handy because one of the questions asked was, again, back to the talent pipeline, you know, where's the workforce? Show me the data. Show me uh, what kind of programs the schools in the Metroplex have. And so we're able to produce this uh, from Dallas County again, the number of certificates and two-year awards up to four-year and post-grad across the county. And it's it's pretty telling. Uh, we can look at it by school. We can look at it by by occupation types and, and quickly get down to the number of certificates, two-year and four-year degrees, et cetera. Uh, as to, and we were able to produce this for a couple of site selectors, and in one case at least, um, I think it helped with the business relocation because we were very strong producing those kinds of graduates and completers. Next slide, please, Mark. So now we move into what is my favorite of, of one of, well, one of my favorites of the Jobs EQ platform and the suite of, uh, of analytics is the real time intelligence report. So, you know, openings by occupation. So if we're looking at, and we want real-time data, and you can see because it provides you with the total ads uh, as well as the wages for these openings by occupation. As software developers, probably not a surprise to anybody on this call today. Uh, it's pretty prominent, I think, throughout not only the, the state of Texas, but across the, across the national landscape. Uh, but we get a good idea about what is growing rapidly. And, and then because of the SOC codes and because of the the programs that we have within the college and we find out where we have our gaps and, and maybe we're not meeting the supply and demand and so we've got to change the way we do business with new curricula new program offerings and that kind of thing you see registered nurses mark talked about that in his presentation uh and and of course a lot of a lot of logistics and distribution 
across Dallas uh, and North Texas. And so you see some of that here as well. Uh, and of course, retail and sales were always high every single month for the last several years. Uh, they always are going to be up there with the numbers. Um, next slide, please, Mark. So I'll, the openings by employers. So using this real-time intelligence, what we call the RTI report, you know, now we can look at what employers had the greatest hiring demand. And not really surprising, Dallas Independent School District, um, if not the largest employer in Dallas, it's one of the, the top employers by numbers and the sheer size. But just in the last 30 days, you know, over 2,500 uh, job postings. And then you can see a couple of Fortune 100 companies, a couple of Fortune 500 companies, and some other big organizations with a lot of pervasive and, and massive hiring needs. Uh, including a couple like Methodist Health Systems and the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center, for example. Next slide, please, Mark. And then what certifications are required? So that helps educational institutions in higher ed by understanding what certifications are in demand. Uh, what do we need to be planning and moving forward? If we don't have it developed and curated yet, what do we need to be doing in the development phase to get something implemented to make sure that we're keeping up with real-time certifications across the North Texas region. Next slide, please. And then what skills? So we have certifications and what skills? So in this case, on this slide, you know, understanding the, the, the biggest openings of hard skills. And Microsoft Excel has always been, to my knowledge, one of those top hard skills, if you will. Uh, but then you see the remainder of, or not the remainder of, but you see other Microsoft products like Microsoft Office and you see Word and Outlook still very much in high demand. So we got to make sure that we've got the proper training, we've got the right curriculum, that we've got the right offerings, and that we've got those out on the market um, as much as we can. And then you see some other things that are interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious about, um, uh, there was one I wanted to talk about, Agile, for example, working with a Fortune, t Fortune 50 company uh, back in 2019, and they came to Dallas College needing Agile training. And we didn't have it. We didn't have it within, um, you know, we have over 100,000 credit students that we serve in a year, uh, but yet we didn't have agile curriculum in-house. So what we had to do was go out and, and partner with a third party uh, and develop and customize the curriculum to meet this particular employer's needs. Uh, but that, that told us something. Now we need to develop that in-house and make sure that we can offer that and meet the demand because agile hasn't always been on this list. So it's, it's, it's risen to the top of high demand and a great skill. And so we've got a couple of employers right now that are looking for agile training. But staying ahead of the curve using jobs EQ data, I think, enhances our ability to do that. And I think just one final slide is going to be openings by the soft skills. And we hear about the soft skills all the time. And, and frankly, I'm not a real fan of the term, um, although I often use it just the same, but you know, I like what Toyota calls soft skills. They refer to them as essential work behaviors. If you're familiar with Toyota's FAME program, that's how they refer to it. Uh, we've got others that refer to it as employability skills. Um, but these are critical skills, and I think we all would agree with that. And, and these are things that we all we all know well: communication, cooperation, you know, mediating conflict resolution, all those kinds of things. And it tells us on these job postings and these openings. Um, and they're in there. And so these are things where we can customize curriculum uh, per employer need uh, to make sure that we're addressing, you know, the skills gaps or the soft skills gap for their particular organization. Uh, but again, just another good data, another good complement to the real-time intelligence report. Uh, and it gives us a good snapshot of what's going on in our local economy. And I believe with that, um, Chris, do I turn it back to you at this point? Sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Tim. A lot of good information and Mark as well. Thank you. Um, we have um, questions now that we can um, start answering. One from Erica Goodwin. How much is job mismatch driving the lack of participation with so many jobs in the services industry lost? Many workers just don't have the skills, interest in other available jobs. Um, that's absolutely right. Um, we're and even before the pandemic, you always have the issue of mismatching, um, job skills mismatching. And that's why it's so important um, that colleges 
do exactly what Tim is doing at Dallas College, and that is look and see what are the skills that are needed that are in the job openings right now and create curriculum to be able to teach those skills, um, such as the Agile. Uh, I believe, um, Mark, there were some questions for you. For example, Jenny asked, when you use the term attrition in a high school context, do you mean students dropping out of school or are there other types of exits that are included in this term? It, the, uh, good question. And, and the definition of the term basically are those students who who have dropped out um, or, you know, and I've always found this interesting, um, students who who basically have just disappeared. Uh, and I don't mean that in a sinister sense. I mean this in the fact that a student may pick up and leave uh, and may, may move out of the state or move, you know, move somewhere that, that, oh, that there's just no record of them coming back to that district. Um, so how the district, the district doesn't necessarily classify them as a dropout, but that, that does fall into the attrition category. So you could have students, for example, um, who, who's, whose parents, for example, may be migrant farm workers. And that student is in, in, in class in, in the spring, but then when school is out in, in, in May or June, then the, 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 the family moves to, to other areas of the country where they can find work. Well, that student may not be a dropout. They may have enrolled in, in, in school in, in California or Montana or something like that, but they are no longer part of the Texas school system. That student is, is, is a loss to the Texas school system because they are no longer enrolled in a, in a Texas school. So they're not, technically they're not a dropout. Attrition does cover dropouts, but it also covers students like that. I see um, Rich has a question here. How do you assign college graduates from various colleges to a particular county? Easy Community College might be harder um, with University of Texas, Texas A&M graduates. Um, so if we're talking about the, um, the, the SIP codes, that's from the NCES data, um, National Center for Education Statistics. But if we're looking at our resume data, then um, when we pull the resumes, um, we're identifying, you know, the colleges um, that the students uh, had attended. And but that's over time as opposed to putting them at one particular um, county. And I see Randy asking a question to clarify. Right now, the number of awards by school only gives you data from 2018 to 2019 academic year. I know that I can get additional years by running RTI data. It would be helpful to select a number of academic years, including an average for the selected academic uh, year. So Randy, um, give me a call offline or I'm going to put in my email address and let's set up a time to call so that I can understand exactly what it is that you're looking for because we have a roadmap for Jobs EQ and there are um, items on the roadmap that I believe would satisfy what you're asking for but I want to make sure I understand um, your question correctly. Mark, do you see any more questions? No, I don't, Chris. And and um, actually, there know, I, there is one. Mark uh, Monica is asking on the what if page, which report does this include? I'm a Chamura subscriber, and I am very new. Um, what if is actually the name of the analytic, and if you put what if in the search, um, it, you will go to it. Um, but it's under, I believe it's under economic development. Um, but putting it in the search would be the easiest way to find it. Yeah, and, and, and Monica, if you have any any questions about that, just feel free. Um, um, you know, I can uh, uh, definitely help you with that. Uh, let your account manager know or they let me know. We'll be happy to show you how, how What If works. Uh, as I said, when I was at Dallas College, I used it extensively because uh, it really gave us an idea of where we were falling short in the labor market for companies that may look to relocate or to, to, to expand. 
And uh, I see Christy asking, will we get a copy of the presentation? Yes, um, Thomas will get a copy of the presentation out to you as well as uh, the recording um, with any uh, periods that were, um, we were having technical di difficulties taken out. Um, so we're at our one o'clock hour. We really appreciate everyone joining today. Um, thanks especially to Tim for participating. And Mark, thanks for your great uh, mm -hmm. comments. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions and if you um, have any ideas for future webinars, we're happy um, to do that. Thank you and please be safe.